The learning objectives of this chapter are to introduce the learner to the need to cool a diesel engine, that the learner will know which diesel engine components and systems require cooling. Diesel engines are machines designed to convert the chemical energy of fuel to mechanical energy in order to produce power. This power is then used to do work. The work may be done in turning a propeller to drive a ship or to drive an electrical generator to provide electrical power. The energy conversion process involves combustion of the fuel within the engine cylinder. During combustion, heat is released and pressure is generated, forcing down the piston. The piston is connected to the crankshaft through the connecting rod. The downward movement of the piston causes the crankshaft and the driven unit it is connected to to turn. Unfortunately, not all of the chemical energy can be converted into work, and some of the released heat energy transfers to the engine components, and some is lost to exhaust and the other engine fluids. Heat is also lost to the surroundings due to radiation. The moving parts of the engine are also subject to frictional effects, and the work done in overcoming this friction transfers heat to these components. For example, bearings, piston rings, and cams. Click on the button to see various stages of. If the diesel engine was left uncooled, then serious operational problems are likely to occur. The high operating temperatures would result in clearances between components reducing due to thermal expansion, leading to seizure. Material properties of the various components deteriorating, leading to failure due to excessive mechanical and thermal stress. Damage to pump seals and seal rings, leading to leakage. Oxidation and reduced viscosity of the lubricating oil. Resulting in metal-to-metal -metal contact between components due to oil film failure. You should therefore realize that there is a need to cool a diesel engine in order to avoid these failures if it is to operate continuously for long periods. Some small diesel engines may be directly air-cooled with or without forced air circulation. You may have some small diesel engines on board your ship, possibly lifeboat engines or emergency compressor engines, which are air-cooled. You will recognize them by the presence of extended fins around the cylinder block or by a cooling fan unit. Direct air cooling is only suitable for the smallest, low-rated diesel engines. For the vast majority of marine diesel engines, direct air cooling is insufficient, and other cooling mediums must be used, such as water or oil. These are usually closed systems with the same coolant circulated continuously. The fluids normally used in a closed circuit can be considered as the primary coolant, with the secondary coolant being used to take heat from the primary to avoid it overheating. Primary coolants are usually fresh water or lubricating oil, and secondary coolants may be fresh water or sea water, or in some cases air. Click the images to see the enlarged. Before moving on, you should click on the button for a brief explanation of the role of lubricating oil as a coolant. The primary purpose of lubricating oil is to form an oil film between two moving surfaces and so reduce friction. In doing so, the oil heats up, partly due to the friction of the oil molecules moving across each other under load. 
and partly due to heat transfer from hot engine components. As the oil heats up, the viscosity, and therefore the load carrying capacity, will reduce, and it can no longer keep the moving surfaces apart. This will lead to further heating and deterioration of the oil. It is therefore necessary to cool the lubricating oil to maintain its performance and condition. In small engines, the hot oil transfers heat to the atmosphere through finned coils or through the surface of the oil pan. In larger engines, it is necessary to circulate the oil through external heat exchangers where the heat is transferred to a secondary coolant. This continuous circulation and transfer to a secondary coolant means that the lubricating oil is being used as the primary coolant for some engine components. An ideal coolant should be low cost, readily available, non scale forming, and non corrosive. It should also have a high specific heat capacity. This is a measure of the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of the substance by 1 Kelvin. K. The units for specific heat capacity are usually given as kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. The higher the specific heat capacity, the more heat can be taken away from the materials which require cooling. It is also desirable for the coolant to have a low viscosity to minimize flow resistance in the cooling system. This makes water the first choice for most cooling systems, usually with the addition of additives such as corrosion inhibitors. When selecting a coolant, it is also necessary to consider the risk of contamination due to leakage. So, for example, cooling a piston in a diesel engine with water has a high risk of contaminating the lubricating oil system. In this case, lubricating oil may be chosen to avoid this risk, even though water may be the better coolant. Click on each of the images to know more about various coolants that are available in the marine environment. Although air is plentiful, it has a relatively low specific heat capacity, approximately 1.0 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. The low density of air would require that large volumes would need to be supplied to take away the heat from the various diesel engine systems. Air can, however, be used as a coolant irrespective of process temperature range. Air-cooled radiators are used on some smaller engines, with the air as the secondary coolant being forced through the external fins of the radiator by a fan. The moderate specific heat capacity of mineral oil, 2.0 to 2.5 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, means that using oil as a coolant is generally restricted to those applications where lubrication is also required. As stated earlier, if coolant leakage would be a problem, for example water in the engine crankcase, then cooling with oil may be the preferred choice rather than using complex sealing arrangements. Oil has a wider useful temperature range than water, although excess temperatures can lead to oxidation and carbon deposits. Synthetic or thermal oils can be used to extend the temperature range at low pressure, although thermal oil is normally used for heating purposes rather than as a coolant. Seawater would be the first choice coolant for marine applications if it was not for the associated scale problems. It is cheap, plentiful, has good specific heat capacity, approximately 4.0 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and low viscosity. Scale formation increases with operating temperature, which limits the useful temperature range, and means that using direct seawater cooling for modern engines is not really practical. Some cooling systems still have a facility allowing emergency operation on seawater cooling, but usually at restricted loads. In most cases, the use of seawater as a coolant is limited to secondary cooling applications, where temperature requirements are lower and scale formation can be minimized.
Fresh water meets all of the requirements for a coolant. However, it is not readily available and has to be stored or produced on board. The specific heat capacity is approximately 4.2 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, which gives a very good cooling effect. When produced on board by a fresh water generating plant, the water is almost pure. Therefore, scale formation is not really a problem. However, the slightly acidic water that is produced by such a plant has to be chemically treated, as we will see later, to prevent corrosion. Fresh water is preferred as the primary coolant for diesel engine jacket water systems, and as the secondary coolant for the other engine systems. The temperature range is limited by the relatively low boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, although this can be increased by having a closed pressurized system. The table shows the comparison among the various coolants that are available in the marine environment. It is clear that there is a need to cool the diesel engine. We must now decide on which components and which ancillary systems will have to be cooled. The simple answer is any component or system that will not function properly at high temperature. The items which will be affected most are those which are directly exposed to the combustion process or are subject to friction. This will include all components forming the combustion chamber and all moving components. The engine fluids, such as the lubricating oil, jacket water and charge air, also need to be cooled. We also need to consider ancillary equipment, such as the turbocharger, which is subject to heating due to friction, and also the flow of exhaust gas through the turbine side and the heating effect of compressing the air on the compressor side. Click on the buttons to see which fluids and components require cooling when the engine is operating. It is worth noting at this point that too much cooling can be detrimental to the operation of a diesel engine, leading to low thermal efficiency, high running costs and engine damage. Obviously, a compromise is necessary. Before moving on, you should click on the buttons to see the components and ancillary equipment that need to be cooled as the engine operates. The diesel engine components which are heated directly by the combustion process are the piston and cylinder liner, including any firing ring, the cylinder cover and fittings, including exhaust valves, inlet valves and fuel injector, and the piston rings, in particular the top ring. The diesel engine components which heat up due to friction as they move are the piston, piston rings and cylinder liner, the piston rods, connecting rods and associated bearings, the cylinder cover valves and actuating gear, the crankshaft and bearings, including thrust arrangement, the camshaft and bearings, the chains, chain wheels and bearings, the internal gear drives and fuel injection equipment. Click on the button to see the As has already been stated, the turbocharger will run at high temperature due to the working conditions of the exhaust gas, the compression of the air and frictional heat from the bearings. Traditionally, large turbocharger casings were water-cooled, usually using a sub-circuit of the main jacket water-cooling system. Smaller units were often air-cooled. Many of the latest generation of turbochargers have uncooled turbine casings, which reduces the total heat losses of the engine and increases overall thermal efficiency. With this design, lubrication is usually taken from the main engine lubricating oil system, and the circulating oil carries away the heat from the bearings. Exhaust side casings have to be well insulated for the protection of personnel.
The vast majority of water-cooled engines use fresh water as the primary coolant for the static components forming the combustion chamber. This is achieved by circulating the water through the space between the cylinder liner and the cylinder block, and the liner and the cylinder jacket. The system is therefore referred to as the jacket cooling water system. The water enters at the bottom of the cylinder liner and passes up the jacket and through the cylinder cover as it exits the engine. This also provides cooling for the valves and the operating gear. Many designs incorporate bore cooling of these main components, in which drilled passageways for the coolant are positioned close to the surface of the component to be cooled. This allows intense cooling while maintaining the strength of the component. The air for combustion is usually cooled by seawater after delivery from the turbocharger before entering the cylinder. Although, as we will see later, fresh water can be used. The pistons are usually cooled by a separate piston cooling system. Which uses either fresh water or lubricating oil as the coolant. If fresh water cooling is used, it is normally separate to the main jacket water system. The piston rings are cooled by conduction, with heat transferring to either the cooled cylinder wall or the piston body. The crankshaft and associated bearings, and for large slow-speed engines, the crosshead arrangement, are cooled by the main lubricating oil system. The camshaft and associated bearings are cooled by lubricating oil circulation, which in many designs is separate to the engine's main lubricating system. This minimizes the risk of contamination of the main system by fuel oil leakage. The frictional heat generated by the piston motion in the liner is removed by the jacket water and piston cooling systems. In modern uncooled fuel injection systems. The component temperatures are normally maintained at acceptable levels by the flow of fuel oil. Recirculation of fuel in the injectors may be used to assist this in heavy fuel systems. Older fuel injection systems either relied on heat transfer to the cylinder cover, wet injector pockets in the cylinder cover, or forced circulation of coolant through bores in the injector body to maintain acceptable temperatures. The coolants used for this forced circulation varied, and fresh water, thermal oil, and diesel oil have all been used by different engine manufacturers. In this particular module, we will be looking at engine cooling water systems. But as you will see, in many modern designs, this system is also used as the secondary coolant for the other engine systems. In older designs. Seawater was used as the secondary coolant for each of the individual systems. We shall have a detailed look at a basic jacket water cooling system, and also a central cooling system, which is a common solution used to minimize the use of seawater cooling and the high maintenance needs of such a system.